All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. Is there uh, iteration one due soon? Yeah, today? Oh, OK. All right. Iteration one due is due today. Uh, OK, iteration one is due today. Good, uh, good, 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 good. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's fine. It's going to be fine. It will all be fine. It'll all be fine. We are going to talk about virtual memory today. We're going to talk about virtual memory today. And my goal here for us by the end of today's lecture is that I want you to be able to continue to explain how an entire, how a process's entire virtual address space can be provided or supported via the concept of virtual memory. Last class yesterday, what we spent time doing was look at this from the perspective of a process. What does the virtual address space layout look like? How big is it? It's huge. Like we've got addresses that are 7FFF something starting at 55 something. So very, very big address spaces. But in terms of the amount of memory that I have physically on my machine, there's no way that I could even have one virtual address space be physically on my machine, let alone hundreds of virtual address spaces physically on my machine. So we've seen what the process sees. How does the operating system and how does hardware actually enable that to happen? How can we make that, that happen? And we're going to be looking at a few different approaches for how this works. These are all described in the textbook. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about them. So base and bounds, segmentation, and then ultimately paging. I want you to be able to describe how the operating system works with the underlying hardware to manage paging, small case right now, and virtual memory uppercase right now. The operating system can't do all of this by itself. It can help. The operating system, it can help the hardware. The hardware can help the operating system. But ultimately, they have to work together to be able to support all of this stuff. And how the OS works with the underlying hardware to support virtual memory. So for base and bounds versus segmentation, we have different support that's necessary between the OS and hardware. And with paging and the OS for virtual memory, we have different things that we need to have between the OS and hardware to support those things. I want you to be able to describe what happens in various parts of the system when a segmentation fault happens. This is a pair of words that you have seen since second year. Comp 2160. You started writing code in C and you very quickly saw the word seg fault, segmentation fault. Today, hopefully, we're going to spend the time walking through and seeing what is actually happening when a seg fault gets printed out to your terminal, and then eventually find out that the words segmentation fault themselves are a bit of a lie. We're not actually using, we're not actually using the tech or the approach to doing virtual memory that segmentation fault implies anymore. We don't actually use that anymore. But we still use the word segmentation fault to describe the problem that we've got. And finally, I want you to be able to compare and contrast free space management or allocation policies. This is a lot of stuff. I don't think we're going to get to all of this today, uh, but that's OK. Uh, this will start to leak into next week if we are not able to get through all of this stuff today. My big goal is to get to this part, describe what happens in various parts of the system when a segmentation fault happens. Um, yeah, OK. So first things first, uh, let's do a bit of a pre-assessment on virtual memory. So I've got a Kahoot running here. Please connect. I like how some people just smash the keyboard. Some people pick funny names. 
Some people pick their own names. And some people just pick single letters, single letters. There we go. Good. Thank you. OK, I'll give you five more seconds. All right. The game pin should stay up at the top of the screen as we go through this. This is a multi-select, so pick multiple things. All right, OK. So what is an OS responsible for in terms of address translation? When we're doing address translation in virtual memory, there's two parts to the overall picture. There's the hardware part and the operating system part. The operating system doesn't actually convert virtual addresses into physical addresses. And it doesn't do that because it, it would just take so long for it to do it what we'd effectively be doing is building an emulator for the architecture that's underneath us. Do we all have a, actually, before I go on with that, with the word emulator, do we all have a sense of what that word actually means? Just thumbs down if you don't know what it means. It's OK if you don't. OK, how is an emulator different from a simulator? A simulator is kind of a general purpose word to describe the simulation of something. When you're emulating an architecture, you're, so on this machine here on my laptop, I've got an x86 processor, and it has a certain instruction set. It has a certain machine code implementation. Uh, my Game Boy, I don't, I don't have my Game Boy here right now, but my Game Boy uses a Zilog Z80 CPU. And when I run an emulator, it's a piece of software that can read the machine code that is, that is intended for Z80, Z80 and it's able to interpret those instructions and then adapt them to do what this machine does for those instructions. So whatever the Z80 instruction is for ADS, it's gonna convert it into an ADD instruction for x86. Whatever the Z80 instruction is for like move this uh, address from memory into this register, it's gonna convert it into a corresponding x86 instruction. So it's emulating the, the internal CPU and the internal state of that machine. If our operating system were to actually go through the process of converting virtual addresses into physical addresses, it would basically be software that takes an address and then figures out what it's supposed to be, which itself would be multiple instructions, and then actually look up that value. And doing that would be like four to 10 times as much work as is necessary for every single instruction that we need to execute. It is definitely responsible for including additional information in the PCB for context switching. So with context switching, we're going back and forth between different processes. The hardware has to have some kind of support for how to do this virtual address conversion into physical addresses. And the way that the operating system provides that information to hardware is by saving some state in the process control block that has things like, these are the addresses that this process has been allocated physically, and these are the virtual addresses that correspond to that. So when there is a request for a virtual address, when you're decoding an instruction, here's how you can go about doing that. Keeping track of free space and physical memory, yes, this is definitely something our OS has to do. Keeping track of free space and physical memory, when we're going from this idea of virtual address spaces to physical address spaces, our operating system has to keep track of which parts of physical memory are free so that it can know where to put other addresses. And finally, checking if a process attempts to access memory that it hasn't allocated. This is a good idea. Is it kind of a good thing to think that an operating, excuse me, an operating system does this? But the difference between what the operating system does and what's stated here is that 
the operating system kind of gets told by the hardware. Somebody's tried to access an address that's not in the space that they've been allocated. The hardware's checking this, and then it tells the OS, hey, some, somebody tried to do this, please deal with it. Doing whatever you need to do, segmentation fault, segmentation fault. Any questions about that? OK. OK, OK. Good job, L. Okay, okay. So we're a li little bit behind. We're a little bit behind. We're a little bit off schedule. That's okay. Here's an instruction. We've got a program that has this instruction in it. Move 10 to register EAX. So it's moving a literal value into a register. When we're running our program, the program's got a program counter that's pointing at the address of the next instruction that's to be executed. The address of the next instruction that's to be executed itself is a virtual address. So when the processor says, I'm going to fetch the next instruction, the processor has to go through the process. The processor has to go through the process. The CPU has to translate the address, that virtual address that is a program counter, into the place where that address or that instruction is in physical memory. This instruction doesn't do anything with physical memory itself. It doesn't try to load anything from RAM. It doesn't try to store anything in RAM. It's just working with a literal value and a register. So there's only one translation that needs to take place for this instruction to execute, and that's when it's fetched. So our, our processor is looking at the, the process the instruction counter, and it's saying, OK, this is the next instruction I need to load. I'm going to translate that virtual address into a physical address and load it. OK, OK, OK. This is a multi-select. Pick multiple options. This kind of goes back to the beginning of the course, this question. OK, good. There's two reasons why we're doing this. This was one that was pretty much stated directly in, uh, in our textbook really close to the beginning. Isolation. So processes don't have to know or care about each other. This idea of virtual memory kind of comes from like, I don't know, the 60s, basically. You know, when machines were working on programs, where they literally were the only thing running on a computer at a time. They didn't have to know or care about other processes that were running because there weren't any other processes that were running. It was just that one program. They literally had access to all physical memory. When we skip ahead a few years to the like 70s, hey, we want to have multiple programs running at the same time concurrently. But gosh, there are too many programs to change to deal with this situation. There's too many programs to change. There are thousands of programs. There are literally thousands of programs, and we can't go and change our thousands of programs in the 1970s. So let's come up with this idea of virtual memory, where we can have these processes and programs that still think that they are operating entirely by themselves in an entire address space but they're actually sharing physical memory with other processes that happen to be running. This is also true. 
almost no pro programs actually need all physical memory in a system. And I, I think we can kind of just look at all the machines that we have in front of us right now. And all the machines in front of us right now, and in our pockets and wherever, all of these have many processes that are running on them. None of them actually need all of the physical memory that's on that system. None of them will ever need all the physical memory that's on that system. This is a bad idea, and we shouldn't have any kind of memory to protection. I mean, I guess I'm glad nobody picked that. A little disappointed that nobody picked that. But uh, yeah, no, we do want to have that kind of memory protection. To allow processes to be faster, arguably this could be true. Arguably this could be true because, because processes don't have to know or care about each other. They don't have to think about clobbering other processes' memory. They don't have to care who's allocated what. They just do what they need to do. But the best answers here are isolation and almost no pro programs actually need all physical memory in a system. Congrats, L. This is another multi-select. This leads back to our first question. OK, so these two options. Our hardware has to be having something for the OS to say, hey, this is how you do translations. And the way that our hardware has the ability for our operating system to tell it, this is how you do translations, is by having extra registers. Extra registers are just locations that our operating system can write to and say, when you're doing translations for this process, use these values as the offsets or whatever. The hardware also has to be able to keep track of exception handler addresses. An exception here is going to be something like a process trying to access memory that's outside of what has been allocated to it. Our operating system actually handles it. So our operating system is responsible for this one, actually handling memory access exceptions. Hey, somebody has tried to access something outside of their allocated memory. Operating system, you should do something about it. I don't know what to do. I don't know any, I don't actually know anything about processes. I am hardware. I don't know anything about this abstraction of processes that you've got. You need to figure out what to do with this thing that has tried to access something out of what it's access something outside of what it's been allocated. Keep track of free space. This is, a, again, kind of a fair guess to make. It's kind of a fair guess to make. One of the problems with this idea, though, is that if the hardware were responsible for keeping track of what was free and what was not free, we'd almost have to have like a complete duplicate of memory. So you've got eight gigabytes of RAM, you'd have to have another eight gigabytes of RAM to keep track of what is free and not free. The operating system has the responsibility of keeping track of free space. We'll take a look at that today. And the operating system has the responsibility of handling memory access exceptions. And we'll take a look at that today. The hardware has the responsibility of keeping track of knowing what to call in the OS when it happens and having some additional hardware and memory for the operating system to say, this is how you do translations. L is sticking to the top here. Somebody just slammed that button. <laughs> Good. OK, good. Great. 
Face and bounds, face and bounds is an approach for doing virtual memory. I'll draw a picture today. I'll draw a picture today to make sure that we are all on the same page about what we're talking about. Why wouldn't we want a user process to be able to run privileged instructions affecting the registers? So this is where the operating system is able to tell the hardware, hey processor, when this process is running that you're about to switch to or that I'm about to switch to, this is where memory starts and this is where memory ends for this process. User processes can and should modify base and bounds registers. Excuse me, this one is not true. This is a privileged instruction, and this is that mode switching. So going back to the beginning of the course, when we switch into kernel mode or OS mode, we get more instructions. We're permitted to run more instructions, which include things like modifying these registers. We can't trust processes to remember the values for these, pro, the, for these registers. I mean, yeah, that, that's actually kind of fair. We, will, we need to allow them to run these instructions to allow for shared memory. This is a kind of a red herring to allow for shared memory. This is something that is enabled in other ways, uh, but it's not part of base and bounds. But this part is the best answer. Processes shouldn't be allowed to access or modify memory they don't own. A process should only know about its own virtual address space. It shouldn't know anything about other address spaces. And if it does try to access memory that's outside of its address space, so it knows that there's more physical memory installed in the system, if it tries to access it, no, you shouldn't be allowed to access it. Don't allow processes to access memory that they don't actually own. Congrats, L. Here's the last question. Good, okay, good. So I'm glad we're focusing here on fragmentation as opposed to the other options. Distinguishing between internal and external fragmentation, it's kind of a semantic thing. Internal fragmentation is actually something that we've talked about, but I didn't use this word to describe it. The place where we talked about this was with blocks and clusters. I've got a one byte file, the entire cluster or block is allocated to it, the rest is unused. That's internal fragmentation. I've got something that's been allocated, but it's not possible. It's not being used and it's not possible for me to use it for something else. External fragmentation, the space between allocated spots can't be used. This kind of comes up with file systems in the form of I've got blocks or clusters that are not contiguous. And so I can't put an entire file within this spot. So I've got, let's say, cluster 1 and cluster 10, but my file is 30 clusters long. So I can put the first half here and the second half over here. But it would be faster if I could just put them all together. External fragmentation is the spots that are between allocated spots can't be used. Again, I'm going to draw a picture of this just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but I'm really happy to see that we're picking fragmentation here. All right. Mom spaghetti? No. And I'm going to take a big stab in the dark and say that it is L. Congratulations, L. Great job. OK. That was a very sad clap. Uh, OK. So let's take a look at virtual memory. Our operating system does have some responsibility to manage memory. That is definitely true. But the issue is that it's maybe not quite what we originally thought. And I'm thinking, like, let's go back to before we even started this course. 
when we started this course, it was fair to think that our operating system was completely responsible for everything about memory. It was totally reasonable to think that. The operating system does have some responsibility to manage memory, but it's maybe not quite what we thought. For memory management by the OS, it's kind of at a lower level than what we've got with heaps and stacks in our virtual address space. Our operating system has the responsibility to manage physical memory allocations. It has the responsibility of knowing what the virtual address space for a process is and where that address space is located physically in memory and which are free and which are not free. It has the responsibility of telling hardware how to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. Our hardware has extra registers that we can say, hey, this is how you should conduct this translation when you see this address. And then kind of abstractly, it has the idea of hiding implementation details of memory from a user process. Our user processes believe they have access to all physical memory. They believe that. When a process is running, it kind of has this perception of this giant address space that it has access to. Our operating system and our hardware are working together to make sure that that illusion is still, still there. All right, so let's actually do two things here. I'm going to talk about segmentation, but before I talk about segmentation, I'm going to talk about base and bounds, again, to make sure that we are all on the same page about what this is. Let's start by talking about base and bounds. And I'm going to do that by, uh, by drawing a picture here. So with base and bounds, I'm going to draw this out, base and bounds. The idea with base and bounds is that we are allocating entire virtual address spaces. That's the, the, the small idea of what this thing is. Just allocate an entire virtual address space. We've got processes that have virtual address spaces. And I'll just draw this out. This is the same picture that you have seen many times before. We've got code, heap, and stack. And we've got physical memory. Our physical memory here kind of looks like it's the same thing, but it's bigger. With base and bounds, we're going to allocate entire virtual address spaces for every process that's running. A necessity of allocating entire virtual address spaces for every process that's running is that the address space, the virtual address space, must be smaller than physical memory. It cannot be bigger than physical memory. So we're going to say that our virtual address spaces here start at 0 and they go up to four units, four kilobytes. Physical memory here is going to start at 0, and it's going to go to 16 kilobytes. We're going to support running four whole processes at the same time in this physical memory layout. When we start to run a process, we're going to say, let's start A, start process A. The things that our operating system has to do are figure out which of these chunks of physical memory are available. And because we have a fixed address space, a fixed virtual address space that we're allocating, and we have physical memory that's bigger than these fixed virtual address spaces, we can quickly make a decision about, well, I'm only going to allow four of these things to be allocated at a time. And our operating system can really quickly just say, which of these 
chunks are free? 0, 1, 2, or 3. Which one is free? Which one is not used right now? When we start process A, we'll allocate chunk 0 for our process. So chunk 0 is going to go into chunk 0. The process's address space for process A is going to go into chunk 0. So we'll have a code segment here, a heap segment, and we'll have a stack all the way at the bottom. The base for process A is going to be 0 in physical memory. And the bounds is going to be at 4 kilobytes. We've allocated the full address space into this chunk of physical memory. Process B is going to start, and our operating system is going to look at our physical memory, and it's going to say, OK, well, I can put a process in slot 1. So let's do that. And in process B, it's going to put values in its process control block. We'll allocate our code and our heap and our stack for process B. The base for process B is at 4 kilobytes, and the bounds is at 8. So now our operating system is going to have the ability to start switching back and forth between these processes. It's going to start process A, and it's going to set the base register and the bounds register on a CPU to be the values that are in the process control block for this process. Process A is going to start working, and the addresses that are in its program code. So we've got these assembly language instructions that are referring to addresses. They'll be referring to addresses that are in that virtual address space. When the hardware gets an instruction and tries to decode it, so we're starting at main, and we're going to pretend that main is at 0 here. When it tries to decode the instruction for main, it's going to start at 0 kilobytes. And we're going to add 0 kilobytes to that to decode that instruction, and then start decoding the instruction, and then kind of go through this process. Every virtual address that's requested will use this base as an addition to get the physical location of memory. That's not that interesting, because it starts at 0 in this case. So we'll switch to process B. When process B starts to run, its main is also going to be at 0 kilobytes, just at the very beginning of the code section here. When our processor tries to decode the instruction for the main, main function to start, it's going to be at address 0 in virtual address space, and we'll add 4 KB to that to get the physical location of that chunk. This is great, and it's kind of simple. There's not really a lot of moving parts here. We have to have very little in our PCB to support this. We really just need to have like two extra registers worth of space to keep track of the values that we have for base and the values that we have for bounds. That is even arguable. We can say that we can have just one register for the base, and we'll just say that the bounds is an offset from the base. So for all processes that are running, they're all going to be 4 kilobytes in size. So we'll just use that extra thing as an offset. There's a couple of problems with this. One, we can only run four processes at a time. That's it. We can't run any more than four processes at a time. This is tiny memory. There's only 16K, so maybe that sounds reasonable. But if we were to take all of these chunks in the middle that have been allocated, that chunk in the middle here has been allocated to process B here. 
but process B has not grown its heap very much, and it hasn't grown its stack very much. That has been allocated, so we can't use it for anything else, but process B is not using it. Same thing with process A. This chunk in the middle between the heap and the stack has been allocated, but we cannot use it for anything else. If we were to take this allocated but not used chunk in the middle of each of these different slots in our physical memory here, we could have maybe one more process. We could add another process to this whole running system. But we can't because these have all been allocated, even if they're not going to be used by, by the system. OK, we OK with that? Base and bounds is straightforward. I think it's straightforward. Allocating full address. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So if, if we allocated, if we tried to allocate this to another process at runtime, this stack is going to grow. It's definitely going to grow. The heap, it may grow. It may never grow, but it may grow. And that's kind of why we can't allocate that. We cannot. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Once we've allocated this entire slot number zero to a process, it is only allocated to slot zero. So very much in the same way that in VSFS, when we allocate a block to an inode, it's only that inode that should point at it. And the same with the exfat. Once we allocate a cluster, there's only one file, one directory entry that's going to point at that cluster. Nobody else will. Every process that's running in here believes that it has this full virtual address space starting at zero kilobytes going up to four. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Allocating full address spaces is straightforward, but uh, it kind of sucks because we're allocating full address spaces and we're wasting a ton of memory. We're wasting a ton of memory and we get this internal fragmentation. We have this space that's been allocated to a process, but we're not able to actually use it for anything else. The idea of segmentation is that we're going to logically separate address spaces into segments and then put those into physical memory. So to be clear, what we've done with base and bounds is we've logically separated physical memory into chunks. We've said that a process will go here. A process will go here. A process will go here. We're going to have four chunks of physical memory. And in each of those four chunks, one process is going to reside. With segmentation, we're going to, instead of separating physical memory into chunks, we're going to separate address spaces into chunks, segments. And we're only going to allocate in physical memory as much of the segment as is necessary. So rather than allocating this entire address space with a big chunk in the middle that doesn't get used, let's allocate the top part and the bottom part and change the sizes of them as we need to change the sizes of them. Let's draw that as a picture now. So we've got this idea of base and bounds. Segmentation is kind of doing it's kind of doing the same thing as what base and bounds is doing, but it's doing it to address spaces instead of physical memory. I'm going to switch back to my darker pen here. With segmentation, we're still going to have a virtual address space for our process. And we're still going to have physical memory.
we're still going to have these things. But one change that we're going to make to this is that with segmentation, we're actually going to change the constraints that we had on the size of our virtual address space. I'm going to change this constraint. And I'm going to say that our virtual address spaces in this system, they will still start at 0k. They got to start at the beginning. They start at 0. But my virtual address spaces are going to be able to go up to 16 units, 16k. The physical memory that I have in this system is going to start at 0. That's a universal truth. We start at 0. But the physical memory in this system is going to be smaller than our address space. I'm going to say that my physical memory here is half the size of the virtual address space for a single process. With base and bounds, we had a strict requirement in order to allocate an entire address space. The address space has to be smaller than physical memory. But we're going to allocate only parts of the address space in physical memory now. The idea of segmentation is that we've got this well-defined structure in our process's address space. We have code, we have heap, and we have stack. And we've got this giant spot in the middle that doesn't actually get used for anything unused most of the time. Segmentation here is let's take this address space and break it up by the addresses that are in here. And I'm going to break this up into four spots. This first part of my address space here, these are all addresses that start with 0, 0. So 0, 0, something, 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 something. This part of my address space, this segment, are all addresses that start with 0, 1. And in this segment, I'm going to put my heap. This segment that's not actually used by anything are all addresses that start with one zero in binary. And at the very bottom, my stack, this segment is going to be all of the addresses that start with one one. So we'll logically separate our virtual address space into four different segments. When we start running processes, we're going to allocate a segment for code, a segment for heap, and a segment for stack. And we'll leave this chunk unused for now. We'll leave it unused for now. But when we allocate those chunks of memory, we're going to just allocate as much as is necessary to have that right now. So my operating system in physical memory is going to say, Let's put the code segment for process A up here. This is going to be something like five hundred bytes. Our programs are not very big. It's going to be really small, five hundred bytes. When process A starts, I need to allocate a heap segment for it. And I'm going to, just for the sake of illustration here, allocate my heap segment down here. This is my heap for process A, and it's going to be one kilobyte in size, not to scale. I have to allocate a stack for process A, and my stack for process A, I'm going to put it over here.
we'll say that this is also going to be one kilobyte in size. As my heap changes, so process A starts running, and it's allocating and allocating and allocating and allocating, and it's making that break system call. I want you to change the size of my heap. We can change the size of the heap that we have for process A by just making it a little bigger in the allocation that we've made for it. Our operating system is going to need to have three sets of registers now. With base and bounds for each process, we had two registers, one for the base, one for the bounds. And again, we could arguably just make that one register. With segmentation, what we're effectively doing here is one set of base and bounds for each segment. So a base and bounds for code for process A, a base and bounds for heap for process A, and a base and bounds for stack for process A. When process B starts, I'm going to be able to start putting process B into different places in the system. So I'll put process B's heap here. I'll put its code section here. And I'll put its stack down here. This is great because we no longer have internal fragmentation. Our address space is still what it was before. We still have 0 to some upper limit. We've dropped the constraint that the virtual address space has to be smaller than physical memory. We don't have internal fragmentation with segmentation because we're only allocating as much as is necessary for the code section for process A. We're only allocating as much as is necessary for the code section for process B. We're only allocating as much as is necessary for the stack for each of these processes. We're not going to allocate something and then have it be unused. Or if it is unused, it's minimal compared to a giant chunk in the middle of an address space. Yeah, this is done by hardware and operating system together. And the way that this is keeping being kept track of is our processor, our process control block in the operating system is going to have a register set for each segment, the base and the bounds. And our hardware is going to have actual registers where it's going to have those values entered. And it will know about addresses that start with 0, 0 belong to this entry in this table that I've got, or they go to this specific register. So when I translate a virtual address that starts with 0, 0, I use this register. When I'm translating one that starts with 0, 1, I use this register. So our operating system has to keep track of this in the PCB. Our operating system has to keep track of which parts of physical memory are actually allocated so that when it tries to start another process, it knows where it can put these different segments for a new process. Yeah. OK, you have a question. Yes. Right. Right. 
So if the heap here keeps growing, so our process is making the BRK system call over and over and over again, it's going to keep going this way. And our heap for process A can keep growing down here. And eventually, it's going to get to the point where when this process makes that BRK system call, the OS says, uh, you don't actually have any more space to grow into. And the OS has two choices here. One is return zero. No, I didn't grow you. You cannot grow anymore. You are out of memory. You can't allocate any more heat memory. The other option is find a place that is big enough to take this expanded heap and move it. And then once you move it, change the values in the register set for that process so that they map to a new location in physical memory. Yes. So it can take any of these segments and then like while the process is not running, take that chunk and just move it somewhere else in physical memory if it wants, as long as it's keeping track of where it starts and ends in the process control block for that process. So that it, when it does context switching, the hardware then knows, I'm going to set the registers for this. This is where it is now. You should do this. Yeah. That was one of the correct options. Yeah. So indirectly, yes, all programs are using physical memory. When I say they don't need all of physical memory, I mean that my web browser doesn't need 24 gigabytes of memory. Chrome thinks it does. Chrome really thinks it does, but Firefox doesn't. But it doesn't actually need all of that physical memory. OK, OK. All right. Yeah, Rosen. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, the question is, if we get to this point where we've grown the heap for A to be this big and we just can't grow it anymore, but there's also not enough free space anywhere else, can the OS just shift everything? And yeah, absolutely it can. It can stop all processes and just move everybody around as it sees fit. That is a process that I would call defragmentation. You, you may have heard about that before in terms of hard drives and stuff. Maybe, maybe you've heard about that before. Depending on the uh, assignment that you did in 2160, you may have done this yourself. If you were doing the garbage collector in 2160, there's that operation where you do garbage collection, and then you take all the memory and you shift it back up to the top so that you have one giant free space. Yeah, you can absolutely do that here. This problem that we've got right now that you're asking about, I don't have enough free space, that is a problem that allocators have to deal with, heap allocators have to deal with. They have the exact same problem. Garbage collecting has the exact same problem. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, sure. So what this mean what I mean by this is that we're gonna have a base and bounds and an actual end or a size for, for segments 0, 0. We're going to have one for segment 0, 1. We're going to have one for segment 1, 1. So we'll have a base and bounds for segment 0, a base and bounds for segment 1, a base and bounds for segment 1, 1, so that when we're telling the processor, when we're telling the hardware, when you're decoding addresses that start with 0, 0 for process A, you should be using this chunk of memory. When you're decoding processes, addresses for process B that are in the 0, 0 range, you should use this segment of physical memory, starting at some address with an offset of this for the size.
if it moves those things around, it's going to have to change the process control block so that when it does load the registers, it's going to have to have those correct values. Yeah. 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 This one can have a tiny little bit of internal fragmentation because as we saw, we called malloc 100,000 times. That calls break 20 times. When we allocate a heap, we're going to allocate a little more than is necessary. So there will be some that's unused, but it's nothing compared to what we were allocating before with base and bounds, allocating the entire address space. There will be a tiny bit of internal fragmentation. Here we have possibly external fragmentation, which is kind of what Rosen's getting at. We've got spots here that are free and unallocated, but we can't use them because they're not big enough to put anything in. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, no. This, the part that's preventing, so if a process thinks that it has this entire segment, we've only allocated this much of the segment. What's, a, what's stopping a process from accessing memory that's in whatever this happens to be here? And this is what the bounds register is doing. So when we're decoding virtual addresses into physical addresses, we're going to be doing a check not just to find where this chunk starts, but also to find out how big it actually is. If the hardware says, oh, this is actually bigger than what the bounds says this chunk is supposed to be, I'm going to raise a, an exception and tell the operating system somebody tried accessing something that goes beyond what they've been allocated. OK. All right. So this is the idea of segmentation. In terms of what we actually have with the idea of what we've read in SBRK and BRK in that manual page, there's actually only two segments. We've got four segments here, but there's only two segments. The two segments are basically, we've got addresses that are starting here at the top and addresses that are starting here at the bottom. The code and the heap are just one segment. The code will not grow in size. Once it's been set, it's not going to change. The heap can grow. The stack can grow in size. But we only have two segments. And so we break this up into addresses that start with, uh, with 0 and addresses that start with 1 to separate this into two different segments instead of four different segments. So when we talk about the data segments, this is the data segment. This is what, uh, what BRK and SBRK are talking about. This simplifies, you know, we're only allocating two segments per process instead of four segments per process. And we don't have this weird extra thing that's in the middle that's kind of not really allocated for anything, which is that one zero address. OK. I'm going to switch back to my slides here. and. I want us to start thinking about the words segmentation fault. A segmentation fault is the question that was being asked back here. What do we use to make sure that a process is not accessing something that is outside of what it has been allocated? So we've got this bounds here. We've got a segment that's been allocated, but process A tries to start accessing addresses that would translate into heap for B's segment. What do we do? How do we deal with that? Who does what? Segmentation fault is when a process or an instruction for a process is trying to access an address that's past the bounds of the segment that that instruction or that process has been allocated. Who prints this out, prints out these words? Just take five seconds to think about it. I'm going to pop open a Mentimeter here. I'll give you five, five, five seconds or so to answer this. Hmm. 
more than five seconds. I'll give you like 30 seconds to answer it. All right, let's see. Okay, this is a very fair thing to think. It's a completely fair thing to think. Let's find out. Let's try to find out who actually does this. The way that we're gonna do this is uh, we're going to take a look at a program that I've got here. I've put this code up on the course webpage. This is some code that seg faults. I wrote some code that seg faults. On the first line here, we've got a string pointer that is null. So we've got this stack allocated variable called string. It points to null. It has null in it. This is going to print out that there's nothing in the string. It's null. This is going to print out the address of the string the variable that we've got here. And then we're going to try to dereference it. This is the line that will seg fault. This statement contains an instruction when it's compiled down that will seg fault. It's going to try to access something that is outside of the range of the allocated segments for this process. Here's the string. Here's the address of the string, which is in that stack region that we saw last time. And then segmentation fault core dumped. Segmentation fault core dumped. I had five options in that quiz. The first one was my program. So I'm going to open up my program. And then I'm going to search for the words segmentation fault. If it's not in there, I didn't type those words in. I didn't type those words into my program. It's not my program that's printing that out. The next option was the standard library. So we've got STDIO there. We've got STDlib. We've now sort of got a sense that there's libraries of code that are actually implementing these functions. malloc is being implemented by a heap allocator for us. I want to take a look at a standard library, a complete standard library, and try to see if we can find out if the standard library itself is what's printing out segmentation fault. The library that I'm going to use to take a look at is called Muscle, M-U-S-L. Glibc is the other standard library implementation. It is really hard to read. It's really, really hard to read code. MUSL is another implementation of the standard library that is significantly easier to read. And so I want to take the time to clone this repository. I'm going to clone the repository for, uh, for muscle. And I want to take a look at the source code. So I'm going to clone it. And I'm going to use similar tools as what I was using last time in class to try and find words in here. I'm not going to bother trying to find a file that's called segfault, because that would be kind of miraculous, I think, if I were able to find something like that. But instead, I'm going to find a search for the word segmentation fault. So I'm going to grep recursively for segmentation fault. This is going to find the files that have the word segmentation fault in them. And hey, look, there is one file that has that word in it. So let's take a look at that file. Sirs stir stir signal. Sirs string stir signal. And there's a bunch of stuff in here that looks a lot like signals for some reason. That looks a lot like signals for some reason. I'm going to look for the word segmentation fault. It's here. I'm going to go to the bottom of this file. I'm going to scroll down. 
That's the word segmentation fault. There's a bunch of other things that look like signals. And then there's this function stir signal at the bottom. I'm going to see if anybody calls that function. This is clearly a function that will print out those messages. But does anybody in this library call that function? So I'm going to quit this. I'm going to grep, for, grep minus r for stir signal. Uh, that was the name of the function, wasn't it? It was str signal. I'm going to grep minus r for str signal. And there it is again in stir string stir signal dot c. It's in p signal dot c. It's called here. And hey, look at that. It's actually defined in string dot h. That's actually kind of interesting. That's cool. If I take a look at man string, if I take a look at man three string, I can find stir signal in here. I can't find stir signal in here. I guess it's just this standard library that implements it. But let's take a look at this one. So p signal, stir signal, p signal. And I want to see where it calls stir signal. It's here on line nine. It's printing it out. It prints out that message. OK, does anything call this function, p signal? So let's grep for p signal. It's declared, it's called in this p sig info. Let's take a look at this. There's only one function in here, and it only calls p signal. Let's grep minus r for p sig info. And all we've got is declarations and What's new? OK. This, to me, definitively rules out my standard library. It can print it out, but nobody calls the functions in the standard library in the standard library to, call, to print that stuff out. Segfault is not in my process. It's not in the standard library. The next place to look that we've got here is the shell. The shell that we're using on Aviary is TCSH. TCSH, I'm going to warn you in advance, the TCSH code is terrible. I don't like it. It's really, really bad. But we're still going to take a look at it. I'm going to clone this repository. And I'm going to do the same general thing. I'm going to change into TCSH. I'm going to grep minus R for segmentation fault. There's a file here called sh.init.c and fixes. Let's take a look at sh.init.c. And let's look for segmentation fault. There it is. There are signals again, sig seg v, sig user 2, sig user 1. All right. Maybe there's something to do with signals here. Maybe there's something to do with signals. This is populating a table here, mesg, with a bunch of strings that it can print out. So I'm going to quit this, and I'm going to try to find usages of MESG, rep minus R MESG. There's a bunch in that sh.init.c. There's something in complete.tcsh. There's some stuff in tw.init.c. And then there's something in sh.proc.c. The one that's really interesting to me is proc.c, process. This is the process thing for this shell. This is what's launching processes. So let's take a look at that file here. And we're going to take a look at line, I'm going to do grep rn here. We're going to take a look at line 1103. This is the first time that this MESG is used. So I'm going to vish.proc.c, and I'm going to go to line 1103. And what we can see here is that it is 
using that table, that array of stuff that's being populated, I'm going to go up in this function, p if signals, p signals. OK, there's signals again. There are signals here again. Let's go keep going up. This is all coming from a function that is called pprint. So way, way up at the top here. This code is terrible. It is so bad and unreadable. I don't like it. But here it is. At the beginning here, we've got this pprint. That implies to me this is printing something about a process. I'm going to quit proc.c, and I'm going to grep rn. So r is recursive, n is print out the line number of the file that matches. And I'm going to grep for pprint. pprint here is called in sh.proc.c. It's declared in sh.proc.c. I'm going to take a look at the first place that it's called here on line 392. On line 392, we're going to move a little bit up. But what I'm starting to see here is number, the process ID maybe, name, the name of the process, reason, maybe. Maybe these are signal, number, name. Maybe this is signal, reason. I'm going to scroll up, 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 up. And what I'm going to start to see in here is that this is calling wait. It's calling wait. OK, so. Our shell forks a process, it execs a process, and then it waits for that process. And every time we called wait, or at least every time I called wait, I just put null in there. I don't really care about the argument that's being passed into this. But my shell here is actually putting something in there. It's putting an address that is being written to. And what this address is being used for is if we scroll down a little bit here, we're going to be able to check to see if the process was signaled. This is something that comes from the wait manual page. This tells us that I can ask the value that I passed into wait if it was terminated because of a signal, and if it was terminated because of a signal, if it was signaled, and if it was terminated because of a signal, then I'm going to do pprint. I'm going to do pprint. I'm going to quit this, and I'm going to say that what we've got here with this sh.proc.c and what we're going to be able to see with man to wait is that uh, w if signaled, w if signaled here basically lets us check to see if this process had a signal that was sent to it that caused it to terminate. I'm going to run this program again, but this time I'm going to run it on my own machine. I'm using fish instead of TCSH. And fish tells us this process was terminated by a signal, sig seg v. OK, so our process starts. We get a PCB. The operating system starts allocating regions of physical memory for this process. My process is executing instructions. It starts running line 6, line 8, line 9, and then it gets to line 10. It gets to line 10, and it tries to access some part of memory that this process has not had allocated. Up until this point, it's been doing all of the virtual address translations to physical address translations for the code segment for this, for this process. The hardware says, hey, this process, this instruction, just tried to access something that's outside of the memory that you, the operating system, told me was part of this process's address space. The hardware tells the OS. The OS says, hey, you're right that did try to access something outside of my address space for this specific process. 
I'm going to send a signal to that process. The signal that I'm going to send is sig seg v. The signal that I'm going to send is sig seg v. And I'm going to take a look at man seven signal here. I'm going to search for sig seg v. The default action is core. And core is dump core and exit. Just terminate. On Monday, you can all wait patiently. I know you're going to be like unable to sleep thinking about this now. If a segmentation fault is actually just a signal being sent by the operating system to my program, can I handle that signal? Can I handle that signal? You're welcome to try on your own. You are more than welcome to try on your own. This is a very easy exercise after you finish your lab, I guess. After you finish your lab, this is a very easy exercise. Give it a try. But I'm going to do this in class on Monday. Next week, I'm not going to look at the course schedule, but just really quickly and informally here. On Tuesday's class, I'm going to spend time uh, talking a little bit about the final exam, because the final exam will be one week after Tuesday. I'll spend some time on Tuesday talking about the final exam. On Monday, we're going to do this uh, signal handling thing. And then we're going to move on to memory allocation, so allocation policies, which is related to what we were doing with segmentation here, with fragmentation and stuff. And then after that, after Tuesday, uh, after I talk about the uh, allocation policy stuff, I'll talk about the lab solution, a solution to the lab, and I'll talk a little bit about the assignment. And then the remainder of class time is going to be spent on paging for virtual memory uh, for the rest of the week next week. I otherwise, I'm going to skip over the summary here, and I'm going to go directly to this and say that I hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Bye, everybody.